Hello and welcome. My name is Ashley Haas and I'm the Director for Consumer Information at Benjamin Rose. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on adult protective services presented in partnership with the Elder Justice Coalition. This webinar will be recorded. You may start a you may, excuse me, submit a question at any time using the Q&A or either the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. We do have staff monitoring it to convey your questions to our presenters and also answer any technical questions that you may have. You can turn on captions by selecting live transcripts, which is the button with two C's at the bottom of your screen. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from three experts in the field to give us a perspective on baseline funding for adult protective services and how service providers can advocate for our communities. First, we will hear from Jennifer Sperry, Executive Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association. She will cover the importance of APS funding, the services it provides, and address misconceptions about APS. Ms. Sperry is the Executive Director for the National Adult Protective Service Association, as I mentioned, um, otherwise known as NAPSA. She has 18 years of adult protective services experience in Philadelphia, the last three years serving as a director. Ms. Sperry holds a BA in psychology from the University of Kentucky and an MA in gerontology with a concentration in healthcare administration from Notre Dame of Maryland University. We will then hear from Ms. Heidi Turner Stone, who is the section chief of the Ohio APS. She will highlight the importance of and significance of state level APS funding. Ms. Turner Stone has worked in human services in Ohio for more than 30 years. Her state level team works closely with county APS staff to ensure proper implementation of mandates and best practices and improving collaborative efforts among service providers. Ms. Turner Stone has a BA from Bowling Green State University and an MA from the, United, from the Ohio State University. Lastly, we will hear from Bob Blancato, president of Matt's Blancato and Associates. Mr. Blancato will cover the significance of APS funding and policy at a federal level. Mr. Blancato is a national coordinator of the bipartisan 3000 member Eldis Justice Coalition. Welcome to our three speakers, and I will now turn it over to Ms. Sperry to get us started. Hi, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be talking about what is APS, why is it important, and throwing in some of the misconceptions in there, since I'm sure there's plenty of, of those circulating. Uh, next slide. First, I'd like to start with the history of NAPSA. NAPSA is the National Adult Protective Services Association. And the APS field really began in the 70s and 80s. And the APS administrators in several states recognized the need to have a professional organization to really um, network and bounce issues off of each other. And the foundation really was training and education. So NAPSA was formed in the late 80s and really was the first voice for APS in Washington and remains the only organization to really speak solely for adult protective services nationwide. Next slide. And NAPSA today, I like to brag about this because we have grown significantly. We are now not national nonprofit 501c3 and we have members in all 50 states and a few of the territories. And actually our conference last year, we had people from other countries coming and attending. So the word is out. But um, NAPSA provides APS programs, really networking opportunities to solve problems, improve the quality of services and training and education for their staff, but the quality of services for the victims of elder and vulnerable adult maltreatment. Our mission is really to strengthen the capacity of APS at the local, state and national level and to effectively and efficiently recognize, report, and respond to the needs of elders and adults with disabilities, and to prevent this abuse whenever possible. And we currently have a little over 2,900 members. Next slide. So what is APS? Adult Protective Services, this is straight from our website, but it's a social services program that serves older adults and adults with disabilities who are in need of assistance. <clears throat> These adults are often um, at risk of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and the professionals in APS investigate these cases and work closely with a wide variety of allied professions that I'll go into later 
Um, these professions are medical, law enforcement, legal, the financial world. Anybody and everybody comes in contact with adults that may be at risk of abuse, neglect, exploitation, and APS will work with anyone that is going to be a partner in that in that work. So next slide. APS professionals, I always have to just tout the APS professionals out here in our world. They are some of the most dedicated, compassionate people working in today's workforce. And I couldn't be prouder when I came to NAPSA, but NAPSA has historically been very proud to support them through our networking opportunities at NAPSA. We have a regional representative meetings. We have seven regions throughout the country and in the territories. We have committees and training, and you have to check out our National APS Training Center that is funded through the Administration for Community Living, and it provides free e-learning, asynchronous e-learning to the field and allied professionals. There's a course coming out solely for allied professionals for APS knowledge, and um, we have a research to practice interest group that has a robust research library, and there's many other educational opportunities. Next slide. So adult protective services, what what um, what to say about adult protective services? Typically, they're the first responders on the scene to elder abuse and uh, um, elder abuse of adults with disabilities, and they investigate and offer interventions and protections. And this is one of the misconceptions. So we offer interventions and protections, but these are adults. They have the right to refuse services or part of services. Sometimes we like to make deals, you know, they don't want help every day in their house, but maybe they want help three days a week. So we work with the adult because they are in charge of their life and their decision making. APS may be the only people to see those that are experiencing maltreatment in their homes, except for unfortunately the perpetrator. APS is the boots on the ground in the fight against elder and vulnerable adult abuse. And that's something I hear from a lot of allied professionals especially the financial exploitation industry you know, or financial industry, they, they say, well, APS is in the house. They can see what's going on and help. They're the boots on the ground and they really are. And that lends itself to having this work sometimes be difficult and very dangerous. So um, next slide. APS programs now zooming out a bit. APS can really differ from state to state and even counting to county. It can differ with the definitions of, of what APS is and what APS can investigate in their statute. The client eligibility from state to state can change, can be different. You know, the ages might differ a bit. The disabilities or vulnerabilities that, that kind of allow somebody to be a part of an APS investigation, if that's the right way to say that. And the residents, some states, APS does do investigations in long-term care facilities. Some states it does not. And the definition of facility can <laughs> differ. So we, um, we all are very different across the country. Same foundation that I'll go to, into in a future slide. But um, as for mandated reporting, APS programs are, again, very different across the country because different states have different people who are mandated to report to adult protective services. Some states have everybody as a mandated reporter. Some states have no mandated reporters. And this is just an anecdote that I think is interesting. Almost half of states require financial institutions to report to APS, and that's growing every day. The resources can also uh, vary dramatically. I always think of our partners and our friends in the rural areas around the country. The resources are scant because they, I mean, they have windshield time of three, four hours sometimes. And the resources in cities and in urban areas can be very different than the rural areas. So um, we have to keep that in mind because APS budgets are being slashed in many states and while the numbers are just going up and climbing. So something to keep in mind with the funding that my two co-presenters will be going into. Next slide. <clears throat> So the need for collaboration in APS, I always like to point this out because this is another misconception. APS cannot do things alone. And APS does not you know, just go out and see an older adult or an adult with disabilities and say, you're at risk, we need to get you out of the house. We need to get you into a nursing home. That is not what we do. And it, actually it's polar opposite. Many times we are supporting the older adult or person with disability to live where they wanna live where the person calling it in is saying they need to get out of that house, they need to get out, they can't live there. And 
we support the older adult or vulnerable adults wishes. So the need for collaboration is because these cases are complex. There's poly victimization where somebody calls in financial exploitation from an office in a financial institution. And then the APS worker gets out into the house and sees that they're not able to care for themselves, that there's a neighbor that's coming over and taking antiques out of their house or, you know, not giving them their meds when they're supposed to be because they're part of a personal assistance program. They can just kind of snowball, for lack of a better word, when you get into the home. So there's multifaceted allegations that many of our partners out in the world, in medicine, law enforcement, financial institutions, can really help with us providing services. The caseload numbers are increasing, going through the roof, and the historical lack of funding is not helping us address this increase. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide. So why is APS important? This is my favorite slide, just because this shows how we are similar across the country in the territories. Um, the APS Code of Ethics was developed by NAPSA 40 years ago, I think, and adults have the right to be safe. They retain all their civil and constitutional rights unless some of these rights have been restricted by court action. They have the right to make decisions that do not conform with societal norms as long as these decisions do not harm others. And that is, that is another misconception because you'll have a landlord calling in saying, this person cannot live in this apartment anymore. They have incontinence issues or they're playing their music or do, you know, whatever the case may be, but it sometimes backfires on them because APS will get the older adult, a civil legal service provider that will help them fight the landlord that's trying to evict them. So they um, may not conform with their societal norms, but you know, they're not harming other people and we will help support that adult's right to make their own decisions. And they're presumed to have decision-making capacity unless a court adjudicates otherwise. And they have the right, like I said before, to accept or refuse services, all or part of a care plan that APS may provide to them. Next slide. I keep this slide in a lot of presentations just so you guys on this call are aware of the link that's on our website that can get you to each state's APS program and then you can drill down to the county or city that you're looking for. <clears throat> Next slide. And the last two slides are fun slides with QR codes to keep you guys awake. <laughs> the um, I wanted to mention the heroes of APS because I guess it was in 2021 in San Diego at a NAPSA conference, um, two filmmakers, Joe and Stu Applebaum, they um, showed clips of a film called All the Lonely People, which was about social isolation and loneliness and how detrimental it is for human beings. And they became fascinated with adult protective services because APS had a different angle on this. And we know that social isolation and loneliness is an extreme risk factor for adult abuse. So now they are filming a educational and recruitment docuseries titled, the working title is Heroes of APS. And they are highlighting basically what APS professionals encounter every day when they're trying to support older and vulnerable adults. And the stories that are gonna feature APS professionals, not just APS, but all of those allied disciplines that work with APS. Um, it's going to highlight the resiliency of elder abuse and, and adults with disabilities. And it's going to really highlight the, I like this, the army of people who work together with APS to protect victims and offer support when they can't protect themselves. So make sure you scan that QR code. And that little cat in the middle is because the, the film company is called the Clouder Group. And a clouder is a group of cats. So I just love that QR code. Next slide. <clears throat> And finally, this is my closing slide. You are essential, and this is going to be a common theme throughout this webinar. You've got to reach out to Congress. Um, there's a QR code. Get all your family, friends, your partners, your community organizations to tell Congress that APS is essential. And if you report to APS, you know that they're essential. So letters to editors, your senators and representatives, federal agencies, Tell anybody and everybody you can that we need support and the funding is it's going to benefit all of us in the long run. So next slide, I think, is just my information. So if you have any questions or concerns or thoughts, you know, feel free to email me. And I will pass this over to Heidi Turner Stone now. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I am excited to be here. It's nice always to talk to folks who are interested in learning more about adult protective services and how they can report it, how they can help prevent it and ameliorate the consequences of it, but especially how they can support those who are working in that army that uh, Jennifer just mentioned, uh, those folks working in the army for APS. I have a sticker um, I collect stickers. My children told me it was one way of uh, making sure that my water bottle was separate from theirs. So I've started this sticker collection. <clears throat> and one of them says, I fight elder abuse. What's your superpower? Everyone here that is listening to this webinar, watching, participating, you all have that superpower available to you to help fight elder abuse and adult abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how important federal funding is for state adult protective service systems. Um, next slide, please. As you can see from this chart here in Ohio, these are our numbers from state fiscal year 2018 to 2022, uh, adult abuse, exploitation, and um, neglect has risen substantially over those past few years. As you can see from the trend line, it's just going straight up. There's not a whole lot of dips. And that is something that's really very important when we're talking about what our workers are faced with in the communities that they serve. Next slide. This slide gives some type of an idea of what we were facing in uh, state fiscal year 2022 here in Ohio. It shows the types of reported abuses. And as you can see, self-neglect is the largest one that was reported. It is also the most difficult to deal with. And after that, we have exploitation, meaning mostly financial exploitation, and then neglect by others. Of course, there is unfortunately uh, emotional abuse and physical abuse and even some sexual abuse. But as you can see, we have some very large categories and these uh, of the other abuses, and they are growing by leaps and bounds. The other pie chart that you see on this particular screen shows you that the majority of folks that we work with and deem to be in need of some type of uh, protective service or intervention through APS have agreed to work with us. 62% of those who we come in contact with um, that we deem to be in need of assistance do agree to have the assistance from us. And I have to say that, you know, Self-determination and the ability to make one's own decisions and, and to think about what they feel is best for them is paramount, especially when you're dealing with adults. We're all grown-ups and we all have the wherewithal to a certain extent to make decisions for ourselves, to decide if we would like to accept help, if we want to cooperate in getting things changed in our situations. And that is something that we value. That's something that we hold very, very dear when we are working with individuals. And that's why this particular pie chart and the numbers that you see here are very important to us. It shows that we are able to work with folks based on their own choices and they can go ahead and say, yes, I want you to help me because I recognize that just a little bit of help will keep me going forward. Um, the next large chunk out of that pie are those folks who have refused services. Now, when we talk about refusing services, we're not talking about from folks who are able to make good decisions. We're not getting into whether or not they have capacity or anything of that nature. We're talking about those folks who are deemed to have capacity and good decision-making skills and that have decided, no, not this time. So it's still a, a small percentage. It's only 16%. Um, and as you can see that we do actually have some folks we have to get involved with the courts with because they cannot make good decisions for themselves. But 62% do indeed work with us. And so we need to be able to support them. Can I have the next slide? So here in Ohio, uh, our system is one where the county departments of job and family services are the ones who actually provide the hands-on boots on the ground service to the individuals in, their, in uh, their community. In Ohio, our mandate is that we are to serve adults who are aged 60 or older. They're disabled by the infirmities of aging. They have a physical or mental impairment that prevents them from providing for their own care or protection. 
and they live in the community in an independent living arrangement. So here in Ohio, we do not, um, unfortunately, serve those who are under the age of 60. Some of our counties do because they do have the wherewithal. They have other types of local funding besides what the state provides that allow them to do that. Next slide. Here's what our CDJFSs do to help our older Ohioans. Receiving referrals from adults uh, uh, regarding adult, adult maltreatment 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That's our mandate and that's what our counties do. They conduct assessments and investigations of referrals that are accepted, screened in. They identify service needs. They provide services themselves or refer for services and they monitor cases that they have opened for ongoing services. This is actually quite a bit. A lot of folks will liken things in the adult protective service system to the child welfare service system. And the child welfare service system is a lot larger. It has a whole lot of other um, areas that it touches. But in uh, adult protective services, as you can see, there's a lot that goes into working with adults at this particular level especially in the areas of assessments and investigating and uh, identifying needs that they are willing to allow us to help them with. Next slide. So how is APS funded in Ohio? The short answer to that is it's not funded enough. I'm sure that most states are going to say that, most counties will say that. You know, the recommendations uh, that are generally accepted is that we would have at least one full-time APS worker and each county to handle uh, what is going on in that county. Ohio has some very, very small counties um, and we have some counties that have combined so that they can manage the workload and have a, an individual that will be able to do that. But you know, when it comes to money, of course, folks will say that there's never enough. And we have seen that our workforce has dwindled, especially since COVID, that a lot of folks are leaving this particular field, not just adult protective services, but human and social services in general. Not a lot of young people are going into social work um, at their college for their college degrees or their um, graduate degrees uh, because there is a lack of funding to support them and their families and to support the services that we need to provide. But in the past budget cycle, Ohio did increase the amount of funding that was provided to our county agencies. We provide a state allocation that goes directly to county agencies, um, an initial allocation of $80,000 to each county, and then another part of their allocation is based on a formula that has been set out in the revised code. So. There has been an increase in the amount of money that goes to our county agencies, uh, but some of our county agencies don't just rely on that state funding because $80,000 isn't a lot. And to top it off with the extra, that's not, you know, we look at that, it's really not necessarily enough to fund a full-time person that's strictly devoted to APS and pay for services and work in collaboratively with other uh, other county uh, and uh, human service providers, hospitals, and things of that nature. Um, there are some counties in Ohio that have local funding, such as levies. Uh, there are some that receive certain grants for certain projects. Um, however, they this money is few, far between. A lot of times the levies that are passed aren't specifically for adult protective services but the monies that come in have to be shared with other services for those folks who are over the age of um, 60 and not necessarily for their protection. It may be to provide for senior centers or other social type things of that nature. Next slide. One of the things we rely on quite a bit since it has been available to us, and I, I'm gonna speak a little bit for all of the states, territories and what have you in the nation is federal funding. Ohio, like all the other states and territories, was super excited back in 21 when we received first time federal funding for adult protective services. It was in response to COVID-19. We were able to provide funding to our counties. But as you can see from this slide, it wasn't a lot. $37,000 or so per county we were able to give to the counties. 
But then came ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act, which gave us more monies to provide to the counties. Uh, so each county then received $45,000. Uh, we did hold some money back at the state to do some infrastructure improvements because we don't have a specific line item for adult protective services at the state level. Any funding that is set aside for adult protective services goes straight to the counties because that's where the work is done. Um, then, of course, we received a little bit more money from the Elder Justice Act, a little under $500,000. Cannot really pass that on to our counties. That would give them a, like a buck 50 to use. So, you know, 88 counties, um, $484,000 isn't going to go very far. But it is going to help us at the state level, since, like I said before, we don't necessarily have an APS line item, so that we can do some improvements and enhancements. So even though we have received federal funding, local funding, state funding is very important. As you see, each of these pots have been one-time pots of money. Um, at the end of September 24, we will be all done with ARPA money, uh, the uh, federal money for the coronavirus relief. It ended a couple of months ago, and we're hoping to see some increases and in strengthening and the Elder Justice Act monies that are that will be coming down the pipe. But at the me in the meantime, we rely a lot on our state and local funding. Um, next slide, please. So at the state, we are doing some things with our ARPA funding that we would like to be able to do um, strictly with uh, local Ohio money if we could, um, with additions, you know, additional support from the federal government. Things such as improving data collection development of our quality assurance process. Outreach and public awareness is very, very important. We do have a law here in Ohio that mandates ugh, thousands of people to report elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. To get the word out is very costly and to make sure that people have the tools that they need. And so we use monies for those. Improved county uh, community partnerships and of course, training. Training not just for us, but the folks who are doing the work on the front lines constantly need to have their skills updated and information provided for them. Uh, local funding is very important to that. State funding supports that, but our biggest boon has come from federal monies. Um, next slide. So here's what some of our counties have been doing with their federal monies. And um, yes, some of them bought a car. It wasn't personal. They just needed to be able to transport their clients to doctor appointments, court appointments, therapy, things of that nature. And so the agency purchased a car to use to transport their clients. They've used money for staff training, a lot of PPE at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic. As you can see from the one picture we have here, we have a lot of money going towards home repairs and updates and upgrades to allow folks to remain in their homes so that they don't find themselves in nursing care or having to board in a different way. A lot of emergency housing monies are being spent and folks are being creative with, with particular programs such as, next slide, uh, working with EMS to provide mobile health care services, uh, developing MOUs to purchase services, say, from the guardianship board. Guardianship is a last resort, um, and normally we don't like to see that unless it's absolutely positively necessary, but it does cost, and so uh, monies are being used for that. Working with emergency competency evaluations for clients and then developing senior technology programs. Next slide, please. Um, on this one, uh, we see some of the things, again, what we have been doing with our monies, both local and uh, federal. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important for us is to improve our quality assurance and technical assistance program and our enhancements to our data system. One of the reasons that's so important is because when we do ask for additional funding, whether it's from the state or federal level, they want to know what we did with the funding that was already provided. They want to know how bad the situation is. And so in order to provide them, you know, a lot of these folks, they think purely in numbers. And so pro to provide them the, that information, we want to shore up our programming. And we know that um, counties do the same. Next slide, please. 
There are currently no federal regulations governing APS, but they are coming. Um, Department of Health and Human Services has proposed regulations for us that all 50 states and, and the additional territories and regions will have to uh, abide by. This will be under the Elder Justice Act and promote uh, APS response that would be uh, more effective and equitable across the nation so that you don't see so many differences between states. Here in Ohio, you can even see differences between counties. Jennifer mentioned that, that earlier, that you're not going to have a one-size-fits-all program. However, we do want to see some, you know, equitable, equitable provision of services so that we can see uh, our older citizens live happily and healthy. So in order to be effective and equitable, the regulations are also going to require that we have some additional funding so that we can implement them. Next slide. Again, like I stated before, here in Ohio, it's the local APS staff that does the hardest work. They're on the front lines of one of our most, helping one of our most vulnerable populations and funding that supports them is paramount to their success. A lot of folks say you can't just throw money at a problem, but money purchases the things and the tools you need in order to solve the problem. Training, uh, supplies, all of those kinds of things uh, assessments, assessment tools, all of those things are necessary. And unfortunately, with our society being what it is, they do cost money. And so we need to have funding that supports them. Next slide. And this is my last one, but I'm going to hit it again like Jennifer did. Your advocacy is very important. Now that you've learned a little bit more about what APS and uh, how it functions, who it serves, how it is funded at some points, you understand a little bit more to actually um, provide even stronger advocacy on behalf of those who are working so hard to keep our older generation safe and healthy. So again, here's that QR code. And yes, if you hold your phone up to the screen, it will capture it. So that would be helpful. And that's all I have. I am going to now turn things over to Bob Lancata. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this important webinar. And my contact information is at the very bottom there for future questions that may come up. So let's go to the first slide and thank you for the slide moving. Um, so I'm happy that our Elder Justice Coalition uh, is co-hosting this important webinar with Benjamin Rose. And Jennifer and Heidi, you've heard from, and they are great leaders uh, nationally and statewide. Uh, NAPSA is actually a founding member of the Elder Justice Coalition, has been vital to any of the successes that we've enjoyed. We're actually observing our 20th anniversary, um, which is an appropriate time to be focusing again on adult protective services. I also want to thank Benjamin Rose and Spry for their vital support of the Elder Justice Coalition. I'm going to touch on three current topics, each with somewhat different timelines. So next slide. Uh, the end of, and these topics have been touched on, um, the end of pandemic funding and funding for fiscal year 24, which began on October 1st of this year. Uh, the first time regulations for adult protective services issued recently by the Administration for Community Living. And the third is the reauthorization of the Elder Justice Act that was referenced a number of times that was passed initially in 2010. So next slide, um, you know, on pandemic funding, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Um, the Elder Justice Act received a unprecedented amount of money of $376 million in just four months during the emergency pandemic period. Now, to put this in context, it took well over 10 years just to get the first $100 million for the same Elder Justice Act. So what changed the dynamics? Well, first of all, since APS got more than 90% of these funds, it's obvious that there was a greater recognition of the importance of APS. But really what motivated Congress to do what it did was the proliferation of COVID scams that were occurring uh, as the pandemic wore on. Things like you know, phony information about where to get a vaccine or where to get a test or things of that nature, 
older adults were being swindled and and uh, it was it got into the it got to the attention of members of Congress who said, well, what can we do to address this issue? And here was this Elder Justice Act sitting there. And that's a good part of the reason why it got the money it did. And it also was a recognition that APS was in a position of helping to combat these scams and address other issues related to elder abuse, which grew out of the pandemic. Issues such as the situation in our nursing homes and the lack of access by the ombudsman. All these kinds of issues were real in the pandemic. So next slide. Um, both, you know, Jennifer and Heidi outlined uh, some of the important uses of these funds um, by APS agencies. And, and I want to I want to spend a little bit of time on the, the ones that I heard that I thought were particularly uh, relevant um, and could be the basis for uh, our efforts to get more get, get additional funding for APS. First of all, any work being done in data collection is critical. We have we have suffered for years in this elder justice space over the lack of good data. Okay? And you can't report you can't stop what you don't report. And when you're trying to make a case for money, data drives dollars. And we have been struggling. Uh, even with the addition of the new system of NAMRIS, uh, that data comes out too slow uh, for our purposes. And you know, so data collection to be effective can also and it also should be done at the state and local level. And that information can be reported and help make the case for why more funds are needed. Emergency housing, that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue across the country. And I've seen a number of states that have been using their pandemic money to help with emergency housing uh, for the protection of victims of elder abuse. Public awareness, you know, you can't do enough of that when it comes to this issue, okay? You've got to educate people. You know, the, the places where you have the best public awareness, you also seem to have what they call multidisciplinary teams that can, that work in the community to you know, provide a more comprehensive approach to elder abuse prevention. But public awareness is at the heart of all that. Building partnerships with other community organizations is very important. Again, spread the word and put the word out about what's important. Um, mobile health services, um, very important, again, for the benefit of the of the of the victim. And then finally, uh, I was particularly interested in, in what Ohio and other states have done in, in investing in technology to help combat the issue of isolation and loneliness, which has been noted is a contributing factor to elder abuse. So out of this pandemic surprise act, for lack of a better term, the nation got a better understanding and appreciation of the work of APS in combating and preventing elder abuse, neglect and exploitation. But as has been noted, but I'm going to say it again. These were emergency funds. They're separate from the regular year-to-year -year appropriations. So it's important to point out where we find ourselves right now. So let's go to the next slide. For back for a little bit of history, APS has traditionally received all of its federal funding from the Social Services Block Grant, a program whose funding itself has been frozen for the for more than a decade. In this fast, past fiscal year, fiscal year 23, that ended on September 30th, APS received dedicated funding for the first time from the Administration for Community Living. The FY23 funding level was $15 million, an important but clearly incomplete milestone. So let's go to the next slide and talk about the current landscape for the fiscal year that we are now in. Congress has passed two short-term continuing resolutions what does that mean? It's almost a literal term. It means that funding will be continued at current levels, okay, with no interruption um, for a period of time through February 2nd, okay? There are two different deadlines, but the one that's relevant to our work is the February 2nd deadline. Okay, this whole continuing resolution process is not new. Congress does it seems to do it every year, but this year it's different because it was tied to the passage of the earlier debt ceiling bill that Congress passed. But the second CR, just like the first CR, would ensure the $15 million would continue through at least February 2nd. But there could be trouble hanging on to that. The House version of the funding bill gave zero in funding for APS, which was its funding level in FY22. And so what could happen between now and February 2nd? There could be another short-term CR passed, okay? There could be a year-long continuing resolution passed, and or it could be the passage of a separate 
Labor HHA's funding bill. But no matter which of the scenarios we're talking about, it's going to require constant advocacy to ensure that at least the $15 million is retained and you can help. And surprise, for the third time, next slide, please. Surprise, for the third time, you're going to see the QR code. This is what's called reinforcement. Okay. We need you to advocate. Do not accept the notion of no funding for APS. Advocate to ensure continued funding for APS. Do what you can do as individuals, okay? Write letters to the editor. You can write, call, and meet with your senators and representatives. Remember, it's very important to understand, because this comes up a lot in, in our work, we're not asking you to lobby, okay? We're not asking you to do partisan activities. We're asking you to educate and inform elected people about a particular issue. And if you're on this webinar, then you have an, an interest and probably an involvement in APS that can be very valuable as an advocate. You should be engaging your agency's federal legislative affairs or budget offices and others to make APS funding a priority, no matter where you're housed, and engage partner organizations, multidisciplinary teams, family, friends, neighbors to act too. Find proxies wherever you can, because this is a community-wide issue. The next advocacy efforts are to work for possible increases later in fiscal year 24 and to focus on fiscal year 25. You know, data continues to come in that shows increases in reported cases following the pandemic. And the more of that data we get, the more we'll be able to be effective in advocating for additional funding. Let's go to the next slide and talk about the second topic, which is the regulations for adult protective services. As Heidi noted uh, and Jennifer, these are the first ever federal regulations uh, for adult protective services issued by the Administration for Community Living where APS is housed at this point in the federal government. It's probably the headline is that it's, these regs would propose national standards for state APS systems to meet through policies, procedures, and uniform definitions. That is a critical piece. There has to be a degree of national standards um, adopted in the APS world. And I think it's important for uh, advocacy to have these national standards applied across the country. We filed comments as the Elder Justice Coalition and followed some of the many same concerns that many other state APS agencies have expressed, such as being against the mandated 24 hour response time following report, as it only imposes a bigger burden on already burdened APS caseworkers. You know, and probably the single biggest issue involved in these regulations is you, you can call for anything you want in a regulation, but you have to have the funding to back it up. Things cost money, okay? Developing national standards will cost money. In, faster response time requires more staff and more money. And so, you know, there has to be a corresponding commitment to support funding. And our position is that the same administration, which we commend for putting out these regulations, should be fighting to have the president's budget for next year reflect a significant increase in funding for APS, both for the reality on the ground today, but also to make sure these regulations can become implemented. And the other thing we pointed out is that we must make these standards achievable and practical for APS agencies. You know, you, you know, aspirations are one thing and realities are another thing. And, you know, you can call for national standards, but they have to be uh, relevant and achievable by who you're trying to impose them on. So we are now waiting for the issuance of these final regulations. The ones that came out were proposed and they got public comment. You can do it one of two ways. They could either issue final regulations, which are final, period, no, no looking back, or they could issue interim final regulations, which might leave one or two categories still open for public comment before they become final. Most of us think they're just going to issue pure final regulations and do so early in 2024. Then next slide for my next topic, which is about the Elder Justice Act reauthorization. And, you know, it's it's a sad commentary uh, for me. I've been working in this in this space for quite a while. And we're having trouble re re renewing the landmark 2010 Elder Justice Act, okay? It's stalled, pure and simple. You know, to, to understand kind of where we are now, 
just to throw back um, the reality of how this came about, how the Elder Justice Act came about. Um, it came about in part because it had bipartisan support from the very beginning. We don't have that now. We have bills, excellent bills, in both the House and the Senate to extend this important law. Okay, and they're and they're authored by very powerful and important legislators. Senator Ron Wyden of, of Oregon, who's chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and ranking member Richard Neal of Massachusetts on the House Ways and Means Committee. Okay, they've been pushing to get a reauthorization of the Elder Justice Act since 2021. And this act would not only take the existing act and strengthen it by supporting and get dedicated funding for APS, additional training for ombudsmen, but it adds three other new provisions. Okay, it provides funding for staffing and nursing homes, which we all know is a critical issue in elder justice, to support more medical legal partnerships and legal hotlines, and, and to put together a new grant program for area agencies and community-based organizations to combat social, social isolation. But as good as these bills are, as good as these bills are in creating what we need in infrastructure for elder justice, they're stalled because no Republican has joined either bill and without bipartisan support, we go nowhere. So next slide, in my second advocacy pitch for the, now I see 270, 218 people who are still on this webinar. Um, that means you care about APS and that makes you an advocate. You have Senator Vance and you could be contacting him to ask him simply to co-sponsor S1198 the Elder Justice Reauthorization and Modernization Act of 2023. And as I mentioned, it would continue to provide dedicated funding for APS at levels totaling $400 million a year for four years, which is a level much more reflective of the realities on the ground today and tomorrow for APS. If you could convince Senator Vance to co-sponsor, he would be the first Republican senator to join this bill, and it could put the process in motion to actually get this thing done uh, either this year or early next year. And the message you need to communicate is that we're not talking about funding that's just purely an expenditure. It's really an investment in the safety and dignity of the over 2.8 million older adults in Ohio and millions more across the country. The term is prevention. We're talking about prevention of elder abuse all, all through this legislation. Next slide. So. Again, as we have said over and over, advocacy is the answer. If this bill is going to pass, it's probably going to be in 2024. But again, to help ensure that happens, to help ensure we get the right regulations from ACO, to help ensure we get adequate funding for APS, we must keep advocating. Not lobbying, not being partisan, but educating and informing something you can do and that you should do. And your help, believe me, because the Elder Justice Coalition is a national group. I communicate with folks all over the country on this very point about advocacy. Your voice is important. You're legitimate. You have frontline responsibilities, and you're more authentic sometimes than people in Washington as advocates. So please use that opportunity to do that. And let me close with uh, this last slide of some resources if you want more information about some of the topics that we spoke about. And I'm guessing now I am turning this back to Ashley. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to all of our speakers today. We really appreciate the important information that you shared. We have received so many questions. Um, unfortunately, there's no way that we're going to get to all of them today, um, but we will um, reach out to the speakers afterwards and have them um, answer those questions individually for each of you. Um, so we are gonna go now to the Q&A. Um, so let's see. And I just did wanna remind everyone um, that the PowerPoint is recorded. It will be shared with everyone in an email, and then it will also be posted to our resource library, which we shared the link to earlier. So looking through the questions and um, Jennifer, Heidi, and Bob, feel free to jump in um, as you see fit. Let's see. 
There's just so many. I'm trying to scroll through them. Sorry. Let's start out with why are there so many differences between states? So we, we started talking about that, first of all, that there were so many differences. Would anyone like to um, briefly address why there are so many differences? I can take this one and then Bob can probably either correct me or add to it. <laughs> but I think in 1972, Title VII of the Older Americans Act added in um, vulnerable elder rights and activities and things like the ombudsman and legal providers and adult um, elder abuse preventions came into play. They were not funded. So each state developed their own APS programs based on whatever funding they could scrap and scrape together. And that's where, and they developed their own statutes. So it's, you know, you've seen one APS program, you've seen one APS program because it was written in the Older Americans Act, no federal funding, no federal regulations. So each state did their own thing. But Bob, please add your perspective to this. <laughs> well, the point I'll make is that having these new regulations uh, developing national standards um, could lead to some more consistency in APS, and that could lead to more dedicated funding based on the standards being applied across the board. And I think you have to also have to remember that you, a funding source of the social services block grant, you got to remember it's a block grant, okay, which gives states enormous amount of flexibility, if in my, in my judgment, so much too much flexibility to make determinations on how they spend that money. There are 12 or 13 states in this country to this day that don't spend a nickel on APS from the social services block grant. And, you know, you have that kind of uh, variation. It's never going to lead to the consistency that we need to see in adult protective services. So that's why we are so grateful to, for these regulations to have at least been issued. And now we've got to work to make sure they're, 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 they're improved so they do lead to national standards and some consistency to make advocacy that much easier to do. Thank you. We did have a couple questions come in about um, providing protections for older adults who don't necessarily meet the criteria for our APS investigation. Is there anyone that could maybe um, speak to that? I can speak to it here in Ohio. Um, unfortunately, a lot of it, again, points back to funding. The mandate, what the law actually provides is for those who are age 60 and older, <coughs> excuse me, and who are disabled by the infirmities of aging. And someone did ask the question, what does infirmities of aging mean? You know, that is a difficult one to answer. It's very subjective as well, because it, you know, I have arthritis right now. I don't quite meet the age limit, but there are days I can't walk. Have I been <laughs> disabled by the infirmities of aging? Um, is that in your statute, Heidi? That's in the yes. statute. Yeah, it it says, it, it, that's how it reads. It used to say handicapped by the infirmities of aging. The most yes. recent budget cycle changed the wording a bit. But, you know, we would like to be able to address those individuals who are stronger, who do not have certain limitations, such as infirmities of aging or what have you. But it's very difficult to manage the caseloads that we have with those folks who cannot really um, take care of themselves. And I think the law was designed to address those individuals who cannot protect themselves. So if someone has capacity, if someone is not, you know, uh, disabled uh, because of their age or anything like that, they don't qualify because we have so many others that need that assistance. Thank you. That's a great explanation. Um, there was a comment that just came in. Um, speaking of um, the funding, um, someone said when you look at the 15 million that Bob's talking about and then compare that to the salary of the New York Mets baseball team for 2023, which was 353 million. Um, you know, there was just a lot of commonality about, you know, where the where the priorities are when it comes to funding. And I think that question came from Paul Greenwood, if I remember seeing it right in the yes. chat, who's, who's a, tr a tremendous longtime advocate and has probably been the most effective prosecutor in America in prosecuting elder abuse cases. So that, the observation is, is, is spot on, Paul. Priorities are 
so out of whack right now um, when it comes to just that comparison. Um, so part of what we need to be thinking about doing is, you know, maybe building partnerships with things like Major League Baseball and the NFL and anybody like that that might all of a sudden take this on as a as a as a cause. There are many causes that are picked up by professional sports. We just we've never really pursued it, but maybe you've given us the uh, spark to look at that. That's a great point, Bob. And you made a lot of great recommendations of how each of us can get personally involved as well as get our organization involved to better advocate. So I really appreciate those recommendations that you shared. Mm -hmm. um, several times the um, expansion of the mandate, mandated reporters was mentioned. Um, there was a question that came in and said, how are mandated reporters trained out in the community? So... <clears throat> We have been tasked at ODJFS to provide training materials for mandated reporters, to provide information that can be used by those organizations that train these particular individuals as they provide training to them regarding their responsibilities as a mandated reporter. Um, ODJFS has not been tasked with providing that training directly ourselves. However, we are in the process of developing some online mandated we tra mandated reporter training that can be accessible through our website once it is up and running and we will make that known our guides address mandated reporters who work in several different fields each guide has a response to a particular field whether it's medical legal uh, financial we also have one for the general public these can be accessed through our through the odjfs website <clears throat> Um, you can get them through our form central. You can either order hard copies of them or download PDFs of them. Um, and Benjamin Rose also, I'm going to give you guys that plug, has developed an online mandated reporter training um, that I think has CEUs attached for those individuals who would need um, continuing education credits. So we want to use uh, those various routes to get information in the hands of folks who would be reporting so that they know how to recognize abuse, how to report it, you know, what to expect after a report is made. So not only are we using those things, but we are also using our public awareness campaign uh, to target various individual audiences and mandated reporters are one of those. Thank you, Heidi. And I will be sharing that information about the training that Benjamin Rose has developed here momentarily. Um, I just wanted to take a time really briefly. There were a couple of questions that came in about um, the focus of human trafficking of older adults and whether there was any focus being brought to that. Um, if anyone could just briefly speak on the human trafficking of older adults. Well, I could try to take a stab at this one. Um, again, it's going to be different in every state, but this is where those multidisciplinary partners come into play. When you work with your law enforcement, you work with your multidisciplinary teams to connect. A lot of times that human trafficking, it's, it's complicated in your communities. It could be a hospital discharging to some random rooming house. You know, so you need to get, you know, your partners at the Department of Justice. There's a great um, multidisciplinary team link on the DOJ website, their elder initiative, but really engaging your local law enforcement to to help you because sometimes you can't get into those homes. But it's a it's something that I've heard DOJ present on many times. Thank you, Jennifer. And again, you know, just really thank you um, for today's uh, speakers. You guys did such a wonderful job of breaking down, you know, why APS is important, why we should all be advocating for greater um, funding opportunities when it comes to older adults and APS. So as I mentioned, um, and as Heidi was kind enough to mention, I am going to share the information about the new online training for mandated reporters um, of adult abuse that was developed by Benjamin Rose. So first we'd like to show you a list of all the Ohio's mandated reporters of elder abuse. As you know, was mentioned several times, there are very many now since the expansion. There's actually over 30 occupational groups who are considered mandated reporters in Ohio. And the list is pretty vast. So as you can see, it includes social workers, doctors, financial planners, pharmacists, real estate brokers, and others who work directly with older adults. Next slide, please. 
So the online training for mandated reporters of adult abuse consists of two modules. The overall goals of the training are to help mandated reporters understand their legal responsibility to report abuse when they have reasonable cause to suspect that it is happening, regardless of perceptions, beliefs, etc. Be able to identify abuse and signs that suggest it could be occurring and know where to report the abuse. The, the focus of the first module is just understanding the abuse. It provides definitions of the various types of abuse, often offers common characteristics of victims and perpetrators, and explains why abuse is so underreported by mandated reporters. The focus of the second module is to help mandated reporters recognize and report abuse. It includes access to downloadable resources such as the Recognizing Abuse Tool, which is a screening tool developed at Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging to identify suspicion of abuse. Since Ohio's laws are so complex, the training also includes access to a reporting protocol for adult abuse, which is a flow chart developed by Benjamin Rose to help mandated reporters identify the correct reporting agency based on an alleged victim's characteristics. So as you can see from your screen, there's just a nominal fee for each module. Continuing education hours, um, as was mentioned, are available for nurses, social workers, judges, and attorneys. And here are some links to learn more about purchasing the training. Additionally, there is contact information in the chat for Courtney Reynolds if you are interested in learning more. And you can see um, those, both of those links are right there in the chat as well. And will be on the copy of this slide when the PowerPoints are distributed. So we would like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, we hope that you were able to really gather some great information that our presenters shared. In the chat, you're now going to see a link for a webinar evaluation, which we hope you will complete. Your feedback is important to us as it helps us to improve our programming. Your responses will be kept confidential and not identify you in any way. We do hope that you will join us for future events. Tomorrow, for example, December 8th, we will be hosting our free annual caregiving conference from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It will be broadcast simultaneously at two in-person locations, which are both Cleveland and Columbus here in Ohio. This year's full day conference is sponsored by the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program in The Ohio State University. It will focus on establishing a coordinated system for screening, training, education, resource, resources, and services for Alzheimer's and other dementia that are comprehensive and inclusive in Ohio. Tim Leonard, this year's keynote speaker, will introduce the Ohio State University and Ohio Department of Aging's Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia Statewide Resource Program. The conference will feature a virtual tour of the newly constructed Golden Buckeye Center for Dementia Caregiving at The Ohio State University. Experts from across the state will examine the six goals of the program and Ohio's path moving forward. The conference will conclude with an interprofessional simulation training by the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. There are only a few spots left to register, but registration is open. Also on December 12th from 12 to 1, we will host a Zoom webinar on the impact of music intervention on dementia, uh, featuring one of our own, Sylvia ursulik Jerez, uh, who is a research associate, and Greg Gorzel, who is the principal investigator and associate director of research at Hopeful Aging LLC. You can register for these and all of our upcoming events on our website, www.benrose.org. There you can also find more information about all of Benjamin Rose's research, services, and programs. So thank you for joining us, and we hope that you have a great rest of your day.